Okay, it's six thirty. Starting it up. Cool. Um, welcome back, everyone, to the Metropole Dispatch, uh, where our Metropolitans are reporting from our kitchens and living rooms across Vienna. Uh, we at Metropole wanted to create a daily anchor for all of those who may feel lost in the swirl of events who, or who just want to connect, learn from each other, and enjoy company in the time of self-quarantine. Uh, we provide support and advice for the international community in Vienna every day. Um, we are working hard at Etropole to get this news delivered fast. Uh, so if you can, please support us if you're not already a subscriber in these hard times and you know, have, and, you know, especially as Metropole becomes Austria's main source of news and updates in English. Um, we need your support throughout this process to continue to doing this. Um, if you could subscribe to Metropole if you're not already, um, either a print or digital subscription or digital subscription itself, uh, it makes a really big difference to us. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to provide a few housekeeping measures. Um, for a disclaimer, Metropole is running these videos to engage our members, readers, and the public uh, throughout this period of home office in Austria. Uh, views expressed in this video become solely the, belong solely to the presenter, not their employee or organization. Uh, and we also reserve the right to remove co comments that are either harmful, disrespectful, or unproductive. Um, few housekeeping notes on top of that. So we um, will be receiving questions from the message and comment box in the Facebook live feed. I will take them on and ask them to uh, the respondents or the guests on the show today um, directly. So if you can just plop them in there, it'd be great to hear from you guys. Um, and today in particular, we're going to be having a few guests on board. Um, so there will be some transitions happening. So bear with us. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to having an interesting show today. Um, so before I talk a little bit more about what we're going to, we're doing today, I'm going to bring in Dardis, uh, McNamee, uh, who is our Metropole's editor in chief and co-publisher with a long career in journalism and publishing. Uh, she's a speechwriter and a university professor. Uh, at Metropole, among other things, she's in charge of maintaining the quality of what goes on, it goes into the magazine and into the website, as well as contributing a lot of her own writing. Um, so if you want to just introduce to us what we're going to be doing today, uh, Dardis, that would be great. My pleasure. My pleasure. So tonight we're some, trying something for the first time, which is our take our salon, which we've all enjoyed for such a long time, uh, and putting it uh, into a live stream. Li uh, real-time feed so that you can we can at least come as close as possible to talking about uh, the ideas um, in the magazine and sharing them with all of you and then having a chance for you to um, join back in. The Salon is a, a old Viennese tradition starting from the time of the Congress of Vienna in 1814 um, to 16. It was uh, uh, at the you know the homes of uh, some of the greatest uh, women of the society of the times. Uh, and it was Fanny von Arnstein who had the first great salon where Metternich and Schumacher and Napoleon and other uh, people who shaped that history met in her living room and talked about the ideas of the time. This was picked up later uh, in the 20th century by Bertha Zuckerkandl, who did the same thing uh, and bringing again turn of the century Vienna, fin de siècle Wien. And really nurturing the exchange between all of the different parts of the society, which is what made that period in Vienna so exciting. So we hope in a small way to keep this tradition alive, keep the conversations going, and keep you involved uh, in how we understand what Vienna is today. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for the introduction to the salons. I've had the uh, pleasure to attend one myself, but yeah, subsequently we, they've all been canceled for the duration of the quarantine, but we look forward to rescheduling them into our Viennese schedules. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the uh, issue that we are introducing and launching today. So this is the Minds of, of Vienna uh, edition for the, the spring issue of, of our quarterly magazines at Metropole. Uh, these are impactful stories on research and development uh, for your everyday resident of Vienna. Um, my personal favorite was the book review of the diplomat Klenz von Metternich uh, tapping into the newly discovered letters, uncovering his special relationship and dynamic with Napoleon at the time. Uh, I learned that, yeah, 22 Nobel laureates are coming from Austria uh, and in particular that the life sciences and ICT seem to be the go-to uh, industries and contemporary Austrians uh, industry. Um, today on the show, we're going to have uh, five guests, including Dardis again, but on top of Dardis, we'll have Manur Jalal. She studies physics at the University of Vienna, uh, went to an international high school, and is a recurring contributor at Metropole, uh, as well as our fact checker. We'll also have Benjamin Wolf, our chief operating officer at Metropole, uh, who's been with us for quite a few years now. Um, and is the backbone of a lot of our editorial content. Um, Michael Bernstein uh, is a freelance writer and American expat uh, since 2001 and the father of a 15-year-old daughter uh, and has been contributing to, to Metropole ever since 2016. Uh, Yale Ososki is a uh, deputy director for the Consumer Choice Center uh, and is the Devolution Review magazine uh, and founded the Devolution Review magazine uh, and also is, the rep is a representative as the president of the in Vienna International Business Club, who also regularly contributes to Metropole Magazine. Uh, so we're excited to have them on board. Um, so Dart has introduced the salon, and basically I'll be kicking it off uh, in a conversation with uh, our chief operating officer, Ben Wolf. Um, Ben uh, is in charge of the front section of our magazine, uh, where we, in particular in this issue, are digging into uh, the minds of Vienna themselves. Um, and this is a themed section, right? So we have a new topic every quarter. Uh, what does it take to put this uh, section together? Um, you know, and how do you think about the angles and everything that go on there? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to be here to explaining a little bit about the issue and how we how we do that. Um, of course, when we plan a new issue, we all come together and we, we um, think and discuss which angles we want to cover and who would be the best writers for that. We get pitches, but we also come up with our own ideas and we ask writers to do that. Um, we've got especially great science writers, like for example, Lana Igrisna, who couldn't be here today because she has a kid and her husband is a doctor, but I'll be talking a little bit about the cover story um, we've got Janine Manam, who interviewed or profiled actually in the, in the profiles um, scientists, historians, and other um, people involved in the science community in Vienna. We've got an international story, which was first published in the Wiener Zeitung, then actually um, reworked um, for us, also with our contributions, about the US Pentagon funding research in Austria and groups who don't agree with this practice and a technology story about the East Austria, which is actually the third best, like third most excellent research institution in the world, even though it was just founded about like 10 years ago. Uh, it's just outside of Vienna in Maria Gucking. And um, yeah, we've got, of course, also plenty of great stories in the back section, in Vino section, which are more about culture, but we also write there about the Alte Sakaha um, and Hedy Lama, who was an inventor by, uh, on the side. So, you know, having all these angles, that's, that's what we're trying to, we, we try to convey a rounded picture of the topic. Yeah, it's a, a robust schedule when we're going to publication every month and definitely a lot of uh, sleepless nights from what it sounds like. But no, it's uh, great to hear a little bit more about the process. Um, throughout the 19th and 20th century, Austrian scientists played an outsized role in unraveling the secrets of our physical universe often to advance the quality of human life, a role some argue the country is beginning to play again. Uh, you know, what you've taken from this issue, especially in planning it and getting the different angles and opinions in, you know, how can we use this to get a handle on history 
uh, and on the sciences in Austria today? Um, yeah, I, I'd say the the um, very interesting, fascinating, even fascinating angle of the color story was that Vienna around 1900, but also already in the second half of the 19th century, and then these first, um, actually even on, like until the 30s, like before the Nazis really came to power, um, and their Anschluss, that that this big mix, this Viennese melange of so many people coming to the city, mm. which was really small at the beginning of the 19th century, like 200,000 people maybe, and very parochial still, and then it exploded basically, it grew to 2 million, 2.2 2. 2 million people from all over the place, um, and, and this was a mix that led to a lot of great scientists, a lot of great discoveries, also a lot of tensions in many ways. Um, yeah, and now, nowadays, in the last 20 to 30 years, we, we, we see something similar happening. Um, with, with Vienna becoming once again more and more the center of the Central Eastern European area and being very open. And one, one interesting stat I like, always like to mention is nowadays, Vienna has more citizens who were born abroad, so not in Austria, than New York, like as a share of the population, which in the New York City. Um, so it is really very international and yeah, you see it also in the sciences and in many other areas as well. Yeah. And Ben, uh, graced us with an incredible book publication last year. What was it called from empire to the Republic, uh, showcasing both Austria and the region and how it's developed and evolved into the republics that are obviously now comprised in the European union. Um, I want to look closer at the cover story. Uh, since unfortunately the author was unable to join us tonight. Um, it's called A Recipe for Great Minds on the Advancement of Humanity Through the Ages by Lene Grisner. Uh, it interrogates everything from Metternich's secret police to Vienna's population explosion in the 19th century, which you mentioned, uh, alongside the, Viet the famed Viennese uh, secession movement challenging uh, the status quo. Um, as an editor and an Austrian, you know, what did you find most inter interesting about this piece? Um, well, she, she starts out with saying kind of that this, this great scientific um, flourishment flourishing period <laughs> uh, starts with a bang and ends with a bang in a way. Mm. Um, so you, you've got, you know, you've got Napoleon coming in, tearing down the walls, the city walls of Vienna, or basically he doesn't tear them down, but, but the Viennese realize the city walls, the medieval walls, simply they don't matter anymore. And then we've got the Viennese Congress, you've got Metternich, who's kind of trying to keep things down, but also making the state strong. Mm. But already there, things are starting to move, and, and newspapers get published, more people move in, all that. And, and then later on, of course, we've got the ring, we've got the um, city walls coming down and all that. And in a way, it's fascinating to see that even though the structures are very cons conservative often, you know, we've got the emperor who lives on and on and on, and we've got other... Um, structures that are not so up to date, but people, they, they find a way to adapt, like we adapt now, you could say, yeah. in this, uh, times, and they invent new things because they come together in such large numbers and from such different places. And, and you see that more and more towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And only when really somebody like, like Nazis come in and, and shut this all down brutally and really kill people and force them out, then it ends. And, and now, after a certain kind of winter sleep is coming again. And I mean, there's investment, for example, in R&D grew from 1% to 3% in the last 30 years. Like it, it just, and now it's on top of the world and we were somewhere in the middle. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that it sort of links its historical, you know, intellectual enterprise with, you know, a contemporary version of that. And, you know, reading the piece myself, I was fascinated by all of the kind of pieces of, of Austria's history that, you know, allow us to think about, you know, how much innovations actually happened, but also innovation that's really relevant to the time. Um, I don't know, maybe I wanted to hear from you uh, a story that, you know, you maybe from, from this issue that illustrates Vienna's penchant for, for innovation. Well, in penchant for innovation, I think that the, the story of Semmelweis, Ignaz Semmelweis is already very, like, special in his way, because he's, he's I think he was Hungarian, he's, he's still to this day held as one of the greatest Hungarians, he realized early on that hygiene, which now we learn again, mm. is, is crucial for the survival of, of mothers in childbirth, and also before already, because he made his 
doctors in the world wash hands that Ak Sakaha and the other doctors were not. And he actually espoused these ideas and said like, that's what we gotta do. And they others ridiculed him. And in the end he died in, a, in an asylum um, and they, they thought he's crazy and they probably beat him to death. It's not quite clear. Uh, which, which shows the structures can often be very, very conservative. But later on, these ideas were picked up on, and actually they revolutionized mm. um, yeah, um, the healthcare in this area, which, which shows that structures can be rigid, they can be brutal often, but, but ingenuity still finds its way if you, if you have people coming together and the needs. Um, and yeah, Semmelweis is one example. There are many others later on. Yeah. Maybe Manu us about when she will tell us about uh, Lisa Meitner and others. Absolutely, yeah, and even the uh, effective altruism uh, talk later on talks a lot about how we can innovate around uh, increasing levels of hygiene in the world and the c cost associated with it. I think it's, uh, yeah, a, a problem to tackle and, you know, everyone, uh, people are better equipped today than ever to, to think about these questions. Um, I guess last question for you, you know, number of, uh, the number of people in wor working in the research and development space in, in Vienna and Austria has increased by more than half in the last 15 years. Uh, what does that say about Vienna's sort of unique place in contemporary globalized society, um, you know, based off of, again, some of the stories you mentioned, but really, you know, the industries that they're working in from uh, ICTs to life sciences um, you know, how does that sort of shape and reflect and, you know, what are the kind of figures that are, that are, that are uh, presenting itself today? Well, it's interesting because Vienna and Austria is a little bit different than many other big places in the sense that, yes, uh, there's a lot of research happening in Vienna and it's kind of becoming a little bit the hub of Central and Eastern Europe, but the other Austrian regions are also really, like, research intensive. It's not so much like maybe in the UK or in France that you have everything only in the capital and then some regions like Styria is actually the most research intensive region in Austria and Upper Austria also has a lot of research going on um, but Vienna has like increased its numbers tremendously in the last 15-20 years and this has a lot to do with um, the effects of you know great researchers coming in Lane is an example she's um, she's not she's not Austrian she married an Austrian but she's not and she's now doing research in the life science sector so I think if you can realize that in, in the science sector, Vienna is doing it, not in all sectors, maybe yet. Um, yeah. We can realize the potential of the people coming here and wanting to live in the city because it, it is very livable and a lot of people want to stay. Um, sometimes Vienna makes it a little bit hard, but if it makes it easier, then great things can happen. Yeah, as an international myself, I'm you know navigating bureaucracy, and it, it you know it can, it can be challenging, but I think that happens everywhere in the world. Uh, it's really what you want to make of it, I find in most cases. But yeah, Benj, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, really good hearing from you, and I believe we'll be seeing you tomorrow for our session. But um, yeah, thanks so much, and we are going to uh, transition over to Dardis now. Um, Dardis, uh, so uh, quickly for for those of you who who just tuned in, this is Metropol's Dispatch. Uh, Metropole's quarantine live stream uh, and today we're discussing the spring issue of Metropole's magazine Minds of Vienna about research and development uh, in Vienna's past and present. Um, Dardis McNamee, uh, McNamee is Metropole's editor-in-chief and co-publisher uh, along with a long career in journalism and publishing uh, as a writer, uh, yeah, as a speechwriter and a university professor as well. Uh, at Metropole, among other things, she is in charge of maintaining the quality of what goes into the magazine and onto the website. Uh, in this issue, she's written, among other things, uh, the city life story, Finding Beethoven, and published her editorial, uh, Donald Tusk's Talent for Unity, about the ongoing, outgoing European Council president's role in representing the EU through the long negotiations on Britain's leaving of the European Union, um, which we've all heard, certainly heard a lot about in the last two years. Uh, let's start with Beethoven. He's not an Austrian, even though we all like to claim he is. Uh, the piece digs into his life in Vienna and how you can experience him in Vienna in the 20, 250th anniversary year. Tell us more. Well, it's um, in a way it, one of the, the biggest losses of the lockdown over the coronavirus is that we're going to end up having to miss some number of weeks or a couple of months of this extraordinary program that people have spent years planning, which has, uh, has sort of all Beethoven all the time. Um, 
however, there are still things that you can do, and this is what's so exciting, because Beethoven, talk about revolutionaries, Beethoven mm. was a revolutionary as well, and his, his music uh, was often uh, the, the soundtrack for the early years of revolution in the, in the 19th century, um, leading up to the revolutions of 1848. So it's really not such a surprise that the European Union chose the, the great chorus from the Ninth Symphony as the European Union hymn. Beethoven would have been thrilled because his idea was that this is about you know, the passion for, uh, you know, for nations and countries you know, joining together in an international brotherhood that was also about a revolution of the people. So this is, you know, the wonderful, the wonderful Beethoven, whose father wanted him to be a child prodigy like Mozart, and so sort of hounded him as a child. And so when Beethoven was uh, 17, I believe, he came to Vienna, 16, for the first time to study with Mozart, who was then in the final year or so of his life. So that that was the reason that he came to Vienna then to to he study first amongst came to Vienna these. At okay. The age of 16 to study with Mozart. Cool. And we don't have any records of whether it happened or not, although it, it probably did, because that was how things worked. And that, but after a year, he had to go home because his, his father was already dead and his mother was dying. And so he went home to take care of her and his family. He came, but he came back to Vienna just a few years later because Haydn was traveling through Beethoven's home city of Bonn. They met each other and Haydn persuaded Beethoven, who was by then 21, to come back to Vienna and study with Haydn. So here we have this great you know, revolutionary composer who was the transition between the classical period and the romantic period, studying with the greatest composers of his day. Yeah, it's, it's a, a good story. It's an, it's an incredible meeting of minds at that time. I, I recall one in the, in the 20th yeah. century where Vienna was a hub for intellectuals of the yeah, 20s and 30s. That Again, it's, it's just yeah. this sort of unbelievable... Uh, yeah. meeting point for, for, for thinking and, and obviously creating music. And I've been hearing music music all day long from my from the different windows outside on the street, which yes. is which is great to see people it's coming really wonderful, up. Isn't it? Yeah, it's incredible. So, so Beethoven, uh, the fun thing about Beethoven's life, uh, there's some musicians where it's all in the music and you don't really need to know about their lives. But Beethoven's one where the life is almost as interesting as the music. Beethoven was a very restless man. He was kind of a bit of a madman. And he he is thought to have lived in at least 50 apartments while he was in Vienna. And, but that's the low estimate. Maybe it was 70, maybe it was 80. And sometimes he had three or four apartments running in parallel in different parts of the city. <laughs> he, would kind of, he would kind of rotate or <laughs> kind of, uh, commute from one part to the other. And part of the reason for this was he loved to be in the countryside, but he needed to be in the city. So he loved to be out. Anyone who knows the pastoral symphony, you know, can imagine this is Beethoven relating to the, mm. all the smells and sounds of the of the woodland out in the in the Vienna woods. But he also loved the stimulation of being in the city. So he was constantly running back and forth. And and one of his friends uh, wrote wrote to Goethe about him, saying, "Well, he was just he was always hiding." from his creditors or hiding from the people he was bothering or irritating from one apartment to the next. Yeah. So he played the piano all the time, all hours of the day, enraging all of his, everyone. And so the other theory is that he had all these apartments because he kept, that way he offended more people less of the time. <laughs> I know. You wonder how you keep your composure at that point. <laughs> yeah. What What were the? So he was. Hmm. I wanted to ask, what are the role of benefactors in in like a musician's oh, yeah. life at that time in Vienna? Of course, the same goes for other artists at the time. But you know how like certainly it was his 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 proclivity to be around and about and and and, and meet a lot of people and kind of maneuver different environments. You know what yeah. role did benefactors play in that context? They they were they were everything. They do, they they were hugely important. Uh, it was the, Beethoven is sort of a transition character between the kind of patronage of the church and the popes and the and the, the big aristocrats, where somebody like Haydn, for instance, mm. lived with the Esterhazys right. you know, for half of his life. But Beethoven wasn't like that. Beethoven had a lot of different people uh, who sponsored him. For instance, Lobkowitz was one of his main sponsors, and this is a one of Beethoven's venues you can see today. 
and even if you're if you're not allowed to meet with people in closed spaces, you can walk <laughs> the streets, and so you can walk over to right near the Albertina. It's what's now the Theater Museum, and that was Lobkowitz's palace. And Beethoven pr uh, premiered the Third Symphony and a number of other major chamber works in what's now called the uh, uh, Heroica Heroica Sal in the in the Palais Lobkowitz, uh, just behind the Albertina. And it's a wonderful house and, and beautiful from the outside as well. Yeah, it's and really easy to, go, can, go ahead. You know, excuse me. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, the, just the other thing is sort of how to find Beethoven when you can't go to concerts and you can't mm. go inside of museums is that all these different houses, you know, we know where they were or many of them and you can walk and see them. And for instance, the, the Pascalati house was another of Beethoven's longest term residences. And that's up on the Multerbastai uh, or Schreifogelgasse, which is over um, across from the, the main building of the University of Vienna, that's right. up on the, on the bastion, this old piece of the city wall. And that house, you know, it's still there. It looks exactly the same as it did in Beethoven's time. And even if you can't go inside, you can still imagine that this is the, the street that he walked up to get to this house and his rooms were on the fourth floor. And you can picture him looking out of those windows across what's now, of course, the ninth district and everything else was farms and meadows. Yeah. I wanted to ask one last question. I mean, I find myself doing that all the time in Vienna as well, getting lost in the promenades and, you know, there's always a new building to, to, to look at. And it's just so unbelievable, the architecture and everything and the history associated with it. But who, I want to know who who is Elise uh, in 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 his composition for Elisa. I was for I was Elisa, yeah, yeah for Elisa. Well, this is one of the great mysteries of music history, and nobody knows a hundred percent who this is. However, there are a couple of educated guesses, and the most common uh, answer is a, 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 a musician, a woman named. Teresa Malfatti, who was called Elisa for short, and she was a very good friend of Beethoven's and uh, someone who, with whom he you know, played beforehand music. And, uh, okay, and, yeah. and in, nine, in 1810, he actually apparently had a romance with Teresa oh. Malfatti. And so this is a thought. Sort of cryptic. But there's another theory that it could have been one of her piano students who was also named Elisa, who was uh, a little girl who needed some sort of easier piece to play. Interesting. So nobody knows. It's all guess. You're entitled to your own opinion. All right. I'll, I will go home with my own opinion then. Thanks so much, Dardis. <laughs> we, we don't have any more time. We have to move okay. on to the next uh, interviewee, but I really appreciate Thanks. it. We learned a lot, uh, and hopefully we'll see you around I soon. I do have one last thing I do have to tell you. That, go in for uh, it. Of a Beethoven that you can experience uh, almost live uh, concert tomorrow night on ORF2 uh, at, I think it is 9... If I got this right, um, hold on, where did I write this down? Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, I, I believe it's, uh, my, hmm. oh yes, it's at, sorry, yes, 920 on ORF2 is a slightly delayed um, live performance of Fidelio at the Teatro on the Wien, where the, which is directed by Christoph Waltz, the twice Oscar winning actor that we all know and love, who was also a very fine director and conducted by Manfred Honeck, an Austrian conductor from uh, Vienna and Vorarlberg, who's the principal conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony. Yep. So this is an extraordinary historic event, this full production of Fidelio, that will be uh, streamed, well, well, recorded and played live over ORF tomorrow night, 9.20. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to chime in. Thankfully, it's after our our uh, Metropole Dispatch. But yeah, exactly th right. thanks. Thank <laughs> we'll remind everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks so much, Dardis. Uh, talk soon. Um, great. Um, okay, sorry. Um, for those of who's just tuned in, sorry, adding some sort of technical issues there. Uh, for those who just tuned in, this is Metropole's Dispatch, uh, Metropole's Quarantine live stream. Uh, and today we are discussing the spring issue of Metropole's magazine, um, Minds of Vienna, about the research and development space in Vienna's past and present. Uh, now we have Manur Jalal. Uh, she's, a physics student, uh, she's studying physics at the University of Vienna, uh, went to an international high school in the, in the city, uh, and is a recurring contributor to Metropole, um, as well as our fact checker. Uh, welcome on. 
uh, to Metropol Dispatch. <laughs> in this, Thank you for me. <laughs> absolutely, anytime. Uh, in this issue, she wrote about um, um, the wrote the article "Untapped Excellence" about the past and present of women's involvement in the natural sciences. Uh, Austria has a long history in the STEM, uh, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, fields, accumulating 22 Nobel laureates, 17 of which come from chemistry, physics, physiology, and medicine. Uh, and today you have organizations like the International Atomic Energy Association, if I got that right, uh, based, yeah. agency, oh, got close, yeah. close, uh, <laughs> ba based in Vienna, as well as OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum. Yeah. Uh, cooperation, yeah. Um, but this piece is about how women have navigated Austria's STEM community, uh, that it's complicated but improving. Um, tell us a little bit about this piece you wrote for us. So, as we explained, Austria has a really rich history when it comes to the sciences. And um, talking about my own field in physics in the 20th century, the, the one says that uh, a lot of physics happened and a lot of nuclear physics happened exactly in the city, in Vienna itself. So names like Schrodinger, Pauli, um, all of these legendary physicists were really active and, and doing groundbreaking work. However, there are certain names that kind of get left out in the conversation. And um, as a woman myself, uh, I think it's a mm. bit of a tragedy that these names get left out. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you a bit about the story of Lisa Meitner, who- uh, I was gonna ask, yeah. Article. Absolutely, so go ahead. Yeah, she would be the most famous example, I think, of um, a woman whose groundbreaking work in physics, in the uh, excuse me, specifically in the fields of nuclear physics and uh, radioactivity, mm -hmm. were gone a bit unacknowledged and uncredited. And um, as you mentioned, Austria has uh, twenty-two Nobel Pro Prize laureates, and uh, seventeen of these are in. Um, the fields of chemistry, physics, medicine, and physiology. Mm. Uh, but I think it would be another one that should have been um, at, given to Lisa Meitner for her um, theoretical work on uh, describing the fission, um, so splitting of the uranium atom. Okay. However, this was awarded to her colleague, um, Austin Hahn, um, who was a chemist that did the experimental lab work. Okay. Why do Why do you think she, Why do you think she didn't get the uh, Nobel Prize in this case? And and would that happen today? Um, so I think the the reasons for that are um, it, it it has to just be the fact that she was a woman, and as, as well as the fact that she was from a Jewish family. Mm -hmm. um, and the award that should have been awarded to her was the Nobel Prize award from nineteen forty four. So. Uh, there were a lot of biases involved in the committee, but there was also a lack of understanding between the um, disciplines. So Otahan was a chemist, and uh, Latin Weitner, she was a physicist. And the work that she was doing um, described the theory that the, of the fission of the uranium atom, which falls under physics, uh -huh. and chemistry would uh, not be able to explain. So okay. there was a, little, a, lot, a lot of bias and a little bit of misunderstanding on the fields of You're the kidding. Scientific. Yeah, that's tragic. I mean, you would hope that it wouldn't happen today, but yeah, um, definitely, I think like things have improved on some level. Um, why does it? Why is it important if there are women uh, among the hard sciences? Would you say? I think um, that's a really good question to ask because um, a lot of people might feel that uh, women choose not to elect uh, these fields just mm. just out of their subjective choice. However. Um, it is important to know that there are certain societal factors at play, um, certain systematic factors at play, historical reasons, and um, that, that influence their choice in an unfair manner. And the reason that this is important is we are currently holding a, a virtual salon right now, yeah. um, in, given the pandemic. And there are other global crises that come and have come and will continue to come where we need scientists to help solve them, find a cure, find a vaccine, mm -hmm. find the technology to make things easier. So in the situation, in the current world that we live in and in the past, scientific progress is necessary, not just for um, the sake of it, but to improve our daily lives. It is just an entire waste of potential to 
create barriers for 50% of the population. Right, and it's it's a question almost of quantity of people contributing to this field. Of course, if you you know contribute more women, there will be quantifiably more people in the sector, but also the the framing of the questions that are being asked could very well be different depending on on you exactly. know where you, where you're looking from. Um, it's a super so interesting depending point. Depending on yeah. the field, um, there is medical testing that um, focuses primarily on on testing on the average men and um, doesn't look into the effects that particular pharmaceuticals could have on women. Mm. So it can also be something that comes into a matter of life and death, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an unbelievably important question. As as physics as a physics student in Vienna, you looked around and thought it was about fifty fifty in terms of the uh, ratio of male to female on campus, uh, and then learned women were only one third of the students. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In the, in 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 physics, uh, women themselves carry around uh, some of the same assumptions about what is normal. Um, you know how how did how did you go through that That's experience? Correct. Yeah. So it was actually on my first day of uni here. Um, I was expecting to be one of the only female students in the in the lecture hall because I was the only female student in my high school physics class. Okay. And um, when I entered the lecture hall and I saw that the numbers exceeded my expectations, it seemed more fair. But the truth is that um, it wasn't. It was just thirty percent female, and um, the fact that as an individual, me and my other female colleagues accepted the current numbers to be to be fair, um, and we had to find the information, find the data to see what the nature of the problem really is, tells me that there is just a really large lack of awareness on the issue, even amongst uh, students that are in the field, and even amongst women. Mm, absolutely. And, and I guess that makes me think about this question of like the initiatives that different organizations or communities or groups of people are taking to um, you know, promote the involvement of women in, in, in the STEM industries. Um, I was reading your article and is you know, really interested to see you know, methods like Daughter's Day, PhD stipends in STEM areas to uh, prioritize, again, women candidates, um, recruitment practices at the IAEA that we mentioned beforehand. Um, you know, are are these be, are these effective? Are we seeing the the the, the impacts of these initiatives? And um, it's exciting to hear them coming out, and you hope to hear more of them. But um, what did you find from those and 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 their impact? I think it is generally difficult to comment on the effectiveness um, in such a variety of initiatives. There are many in uh, Austria, um, but more focused in fields of. Um, getting girls to codes and, and go, jo having girls join the IT fields. So uh, you mentioned Daughter's Day, for example. I think initiatives like that, where the focus is on um, school students and young girls, uh, are, are should be very effective in theory, mm -hmm. because that is an age in which um, a lot of um, gender norms and stereotypes have a large effect on a student's decision making and um, understanding of the world in general. So in Austria, it is also the similar age where students have to choose to specialize which school, type of school they might go into and kind of narrow down their, their future paths in education. Mm. So I think tackling the problem at this volatile age is especially helpful um, since it ensures that the problem is sort of tackled from the roots and the, this is definitely something that would improve the numbers. Um, you mentioned also employment practices mm. in your question. So um, the IAEA has taken um, its, its issues with gender disparity in the numbers very seriously, I feel. And um, from what I have learned, the, the goal is 50-50. The goal is to try to get 100% quality, so to say. And um, in order to do this, there are uh, measures taken at the employment stage, but also in the workspace itself. And I feel that this would be something that is uh, extremely effective. So making the workspace um, mother friendly or child care friendly as well, having the child care center at the facilities, um, having breaks for nursing mothers, things like this, and having um, also leave for fam family, family emergencies. These are measures that both men and benefit, both working parents can definitely benefit from, but especially women who are working in such fields 
and are also planning to have family. Um, because I read that in 2015, 60% um, of physics graduates, female, felt that um, there was a strong incompatibility between their career and um, the family lifestyle. And I feel that in Austria, despite all of the maternal systems that are in place to um, support women, the childcare responsibility still traditionally lies on women. Yeah. So, no, it's a really interesting point, and you see different attempts and levels of awareness by, you know, on a national scale and a you know by company by company level, and you know where are these practices sort of coming from? Is it a UN agency like UN Women that can uh, promote these 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 conversations in mainstream, if that's the word we want to use, practices yeah. in, 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 in into into organizations and companies? Um, you know, I've worked for a variety of for-profit and non-profit companies in, you know, my seven-year career, and you see much different worlds. I mean, it really depends on where you are, what you're doing, and um, yeah, I mean, it's exciting to see that some people are taking the initiative, but you really wonder, you know, what it will take to, to mainstream these questions uh, into the, yeah, kind of day-to-day -day efforts, and yeah, hopefully, you know, I don't know, this this, this period of, uh, of, 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 of reflection under quarantine, you know, gives us some space to think about this because really it puts the onus on how you manage your family, how you manage your home dynamic and, and all of these important questions. But uh, Manuit, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come in with us. Um, again, thank you for the contribution and all of your fact checking when we do publish these magazines. Um, and hopefully we'll see you around soon. Thank you so much, James, again, for having me. Absolutely. Cool. Talk soon. Uh, bye bye. Yeah, for all of those who are just turning in, uh, tuning in, this is the Metropole Dispatch Metropole's quarantine live stream, uh, and today we're discussing the spring issue of Metropole's magazine, Minds of Vienna, about research and development in Vienna's past and present. Uh, up next, uh, another contributor we have, Michael uh, Bernstein. Michael is a freelance writer and American expat since two thousand one. That's a long time, uh, and the father of a fifteen year old. Um, that means she was probably born in Vienna, if that's correct. Uh, and, 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 and a Metropole contributor since 2016 who wrote the piece, How to Raise a Scientist in Vienna, where he discusses the resources available in Vienna online and offline uh, for this convenient moment to dig into STEM, again, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics interests, uh, and why it's important to nurture STEM skill sets in your children and how you might get started. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. So you write in your piece that children are natural-born scientists. What do you mean by that? Well, just they're innately curious creatures, as any parent will know or as anybody knows from their own childhood. I mean, ask, visit any two-year-old, and all they say is, why, 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 why? And, uh, you know, they're... they're so the, the issue is not so much interesting them in, in getting them interested in science, but keeping them interested in science. And that's, uh, that's really the ticket. And my article is really focusing on younger children and what we can do for them in Vienna mm. to further that stimulation, that interest in, in science. And this is not about um, getting them into the laboratories to discover <laughs> corona or something like that, but um, it's... Uh, uh, and there are, you know, plenty of uh, great educational opportunities for, for older children in Vienna between the, um, it's called the Ria Gymnasium. There are specific high schools, uh, middle schools and high schools for, uh, that focus on science and then all the way up to the university level. Mm. Um, but this article was more about how to get young children, children from by the time they're, you know, um, crawling around on, 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 as toddlers. Uh, to go to, for example, the Zoo Museum here has a great exhibition called um, Ocean, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a playground, an indoor playground, but it's just filled with these great scientific... Uh, yeah, I remember myself being... I remember myself being captivated by the aquarium in my hometown that we were lucky enough to have one and checking out the manatees and all of this stuff. And it was, you know, you, you, you like to think it's a nice idea today, but really it was such an interest at that time uh, and it, it sounds like to me this question is personal to you. How how is that? Well, you know, like I say, I have a I have a fifteen year old daughter now, so uh, you know, this uh, I wasn't actively trying to get her into interest in science at all, and, uh, and to this day she kind of is not. <laughs> mm. Not so much my fault, but her fault of her bad teacher in high school, and that's that's a big problem. It's like I, 
wrote in some of my articles, like all it takes is one bad teacher, one bad science teacher in the school to turn the kid completely off the subject. God knows I had one. My sister could attest to that. Mm. Um, um, but, uh, you know, it's not too, it's not the end of the world if that happens. It's mm. never too late to get your kid back interested again. Right. And it's a question of like, I mean, parental guidance on some level, right? If you're right. aware that there's a keen interest and, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm from the Connecticut, I guess you are too. I forgot to mention yes, that we're, uh, we're two Connecticut natives uh, here in Vienna right now. Yeah. Not megas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the packy. The, yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. Right. I haven't been to the packy in a while with this court, <laughs> this quarantine, um, you know, in, in the U S right. We, you know, I, I was exposed to these questions, both from interest of my family, but also, you know, in school in part. But, you know, these these things sort of peter out. And there isn't, you know, compared to Austria, I feel like there's a system where very early on they decide, like, okay, you're going to go down this stream, you're going to go down that stream, um, you know, and Godspeed, right? Good luck with, with that level of technical specification. Um, have you felt like that, you know, as a parent in Vienna uh, was different from your experience, you know, either growing up in Connecticut uh, or what you've seen elsewhere? Uh, there's a huge difference in the education systems, and I would encourage all expats in Vienna to read this book that we... Oh, yeah, The Survival <laughs> Guide. <laughs> Survival Guide for Education. If you're mystified by the Austrian education system, specifically you have questions about Vienna, um, pick up a copy, read it. That's everything you need to know. I wish I had had that when I was starting off. But it was shocking, the differences between the American system. And I'm sure there's big differences uh, also between uh, other country systems in Austria. But what shocked me the most is that you have to make a decision for your child when they're coming out of elementary school about the whole course of their life, pretty much. Uh, I mean, it's, never, it's not impossible to change that course halfway through. Mm. But really, when in the last year of elementary school, you as a parent would operation for a teacher, of course, has to decide what path they're going on, whether it's going to be on an academic route or on a trade route or you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. That was a huge shock to me. Definitely. I wish I know more about it. So I really encourage new, par new parents who are coming to Vienna or thinking of coming to Vienna with their parents, get a copy of this book. It will save your life. It's good advice. I've 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 skimmed through it myself, and albeit I'm available not, on metropole.at. Yeah, in our shop, uh, thing <laughs> the promotion is appreciated. Um, yeah, what what I mean, I guess in that sense, you know, what advice, you know, not necessarily country specific, would you give to parents who are trying to nurture that 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 interest? I mean, it's one thing to go to the museums every now and again, but you can't do that every day. Um, are there, you know? small tasks or little activities that you can kind of feed into your um, lifestyle. Yesterday yesterday we were on with uh, Holly, who runs You Shine Vienna, talking about mental and emotional health. And she has her two kids at home in Oklahoma, visiting her um, family there. And, and it, yeah, I could tell she was looking, pining for stuff to do with her children, because I imagine, you know, the unforeseeable amount of time uh, we'll be all be spending in these confines. You know, what, you know, I guess what are things generally that parents can do, but also, I guess, in the context of this sort of quarantine that you might be. Right. Well, of course, the article went to, and the whole issue went to press before Corona reared its ugly head. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of things I included in the article and a lot of the activities are all stuff that you can, uh, you have to physically go to. And a lot of those have been canceled. And actually, I'm sorry about that because the, the, the listings in the article uh, of the events, a lot mm. of them have been canceled or postponed. I'll try to uh, make an update about that and post it online. Um, and since then, uh, since Corona, I've been following on Facebook and people, the parents that I know have been posting numerous things about what you can do just at home. Um, websites that you can go to, videos you can watch and, and activities you can do, even simple experiments you could do in the kitchen, you know, with food coloring and uh, baking soda and vinegar and things like that. Too. Totally. But this, I mean, Corona itself is a huge teaching moment for kids right now. I mean, what, uh, and this is not just about how to wash your hands, you know, of course that's important, but, um, you know, to teach them about biology, about sociology, about, um, you know, everything about that, you know, how, how people can relate to each other. This is a huge opportunity for parents and teachers who are doing e-learning to communicate with children uh, 
a huge lesson on science and mm -hmm. hoping that will simulate some kids to, to go further with the subject. Cool. Uh, Michael, that's all we have time for now, but uh, we really appreciate both your contribution to the magazine, the, the, the issue we have, um, the education guides that you've been able to support us with, uh, and generally knowledge. So really, if people have questions looking for advice, uh, feed it into the chat box, but we can also you know, manage questions in different forums, whether it's on our social media or directly to the website. Um, Michael will definitely be there to reach out and uh, we can provide a link. But yeah, again, thanks so much for, for coming onto the show today. Thank you, Ryan. I just want to say thank you to Metropole too for being such a valuable resource during this, uh, these trying times uh, for all the non-native speakers in, in Vienna. Uh, you're doing a really great service and keep up the good work. Thanks to you, Ryan and Maggie and Nardis and everybody for hanging in there. Awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're all learning new things every day here. Okay. It's great. <laughs> cool. All right, Michael, take care. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, this is Metropole Dispatch, uh, Metropole's quarantine live stream. Uh, and today we ha are discussing the spring issue of Metropole's magazine, it Minds of Vienna, about uh, research and development in Vienna's past and present. Um, on with us now is another con contributor, uh, Yale Asos Asoski. Uh, he is a deputy director of the Consumer Choice Center and senior development officer at Students for Liberty. He founded the Devolution Review magazine uh, and wrote the piece, Put Your Money Where the Data Is. Uh, and he's clearly more of a radio expert than I am with that microphone there. I'm a bit jealous. Uh, but welcome on to the show. Thank you, Ryan. This is my uh, first time caller, but long time listener. <laughs> Glad to hear. Um, it looks, this so, so that his piece, uh, Put Your Money Where the Data Is, looks into a new philosophy of philanthropy uh, that's reframing how people give money. Uh, rather than just giving based on, uh, on need, uh, this approach looks at uh, personal giving to uh, important causes. Can you tell us a little bit about this idea of effective altruism? Sure. So this uh, really began thanks to Peter Singer, who is a uh, Australian uh, ethics professor. And it was a sort of new field of ethics. Mm -hmm. and especially throughout the Commonwealth and the broader world, people are getting richer, so they want to give back to their communities. And what he sort of developed was this idea of effective altruism. We want to be altruists, but we want to make sure that what we're doing has the most amount of impact. So that's kind of the essential premise that he put together. And it's not a really new idea, it's just been packaged kind of for the 21st century. But this is sort of the same thing that has been talked about with consequentialism, um, with uh, John Stuart Mill, you have to think of Jeremy Bartham, you have to think of the, the great classical liberal uh, philosophers who had been talking about this for a long time. What is the most effective way that we can use our money or our economics as individuals uh, to try to improve the state of the world? Mm. And I think that's what uh, really we've seen from the effective altruism movement in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. They kind of have put together their own clubs. Um, even if people don't use the label, it's what we think about a lot more. Mm -hmm. Where can my money go that it will be the most effective? Is it going to go to the uh, soup pantry that's down the street or sure. perhaps to providing nets and malaria pills in different African countries that can actually save lives right away? Mm. That's the kind of um, calculation that you have to make when you're into effective altruism ideas. And to bring up what is relevant today, you look at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, they were very, very early in putting up money to fight coronavirus um, beginning in China. And they put up $100 million, and they're looking for any type of treatment. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the best ways to help mitigate this and to really ease the burden on a lot of public health departments. I was going to ask, yeah. It's this, focus on. it's this question of sort of practical fixes. And I, you know, I wanted to ask about Bill Gates because you know, we all know him for founding Microsoft. He's a super innovative uh, individual who's shaped the world as we know it, but is now interested in philanthropy. He stepped down from the board of, I believe, Berkshire Hathaway and other companies he was working with as of like last week, uh, just so that he could focus on the amount of philanthropy he's doing. Um, and these sort of practical fixes that spur real change in people's lives, um, you know, it's, it sounds easy, but it, it's super difficult. What would you say this looks like from the view of Bill Gates? I mean, this is one really important case, but I feel like there's other cases as well in, in, the, in the article you wrote. 
So for yeah, for uh, wh what I covered in the article was really the sort of last ten years where Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, where they put most of their emphasis in their money, is figuring out what's the best way to provide sanitary toilets and plumbing to people throughout the world. Um, so this is mostly in the global south. We kind of take modern plumbing and toilets for granted, uh, but for those places that don't have that, that is actually harming them. Mm -hmm. It is really keeping unsanitary locations, homes, um, even office buildings in some countries. And he saw that there are so many diseases tied to that, that if you could develop a modern, cheap toilet that could use less water, that could be environmentally friendly, you can actually impact people's lives directly today. So he, he is, uh, if you watch the Netflix documentary, Inside Bill's Brain. Sure, yeah, I've um, seen it, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, you can see that that's where he wanted to focus, and it was this small idea, and it was where can we make the most change with the most targeted investment? And that's kind of the broader idea of effective altruism. Mm. And it's, yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a new paradigm. It's, you know, where, the, where both the focus and target of the giving and the way we make choices is, is all of a sudden something data-driven, and like, can you give me some examples maybe of cases where the giver themselves is empowered in this dimension? Yeah, and, and that's a lot of the balance. It, it is a lot about um, your feeling as an individual when you give. Uh -huh. Because there's a lot of, there's amazing causes out there. Everyone knows it. I mean, I've been a part of nonprofits. Everyone's been uh, either involved in one or has given to one. Uh, there's a great feeling that comes with giving, but there's an even better feeling that comes from knowing that you give effectively. And that's kind of what the movement is all about. The more recent examples that we've kind of seen do relate to things like climate change. Um, if you are worried about the effects of climate change and mitigation, um, you know, there are people who give to Greenpeace and they do more activism, mm -hmm. um, but there's actually the recommendation that if you were to offer cash to countries so that they preserve their rainforests, uh, which is what one um, group does, that you're actually going to have more of an impact in terms of offsetting a lot of the carbon footprint around the world. Mm -hmm. um, another example is uh, something that the Copenhagen Consensus Center put together. This is the Danish economist and political scientist Bjorn Lomborg. Mm -hmm. And they put together um, sort of the greatest 12 economists they could find. And they said, look, how could we change the world with $75 billion? What could we do? Mm -hmm. And the number one thing that they looked at is the best way to do it is actually to provide nutrients, micronutrients to people and to invest in vaccines. Mm -hmm. If you had all the money in the world, that would be the best way to actually impact people's lives and to have the most effective giving uh, that we can really calculate. So I think these are some small examples. There's there's a lot of different ones in the literature, and, and hopefully I cover a good amount in the article yeah. that, that people who are very interested in can follow. Cool. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I mean, this, this perennial question that comes up um, of late, I mean, whether it's, you know, at the UNF, you know, FCCC, so the Climate Change Convention and, you know, other conversations happening, whether it's through promotion by Greta Thunberg or just the questions that we're actually facing in our daily basis. I mean, climate change has become such a important question that we don't know how we can fix ourselves always, right? We can stop eating, we can, uh, you know, stop eating meat, for example, we can do other, take other measures personally, but you know, what has this done to this question of climate change? And, and, and you know, if you could just speak up a little bit, I, there's some questions about the audio. Um, oh, don't worry, that can go loud. Cool. Um, I think, yeah, for climate change specifically, what uh, is really presented with this question of effective altruism is if we were able to target this with a lot of money, how could we change it and what would we need to do? And that's kind of this this balance that we have between those that say that we need immediate action, stopping all fossil fuels, and then those that say, well, we actually need to invest in the smarter mitigation solutions, such as carbon offsets, protecting rainforests, and this kind of like. Mm. I think that's where you're going to have a lot of tension, and it's not necessarily always going to come from governments. I think there's a lot of emphasis on that and seeing where government is going, but all the effective altruism movement are private individuals. It's people who are involved in philanthropy. And that's kind of where you're seeing a lot of action. You're seeing a lot of focus and resources. And I think that would be very important for um, not only people who are interested in this issue, but who actually do want to have some kind of change. And the, the charity that I mentioned before, but without the name, is Cool Earth. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that provides the carbon offsets and protecting the rainforest. 
but yeah, it's it's going to be a, a big battle. It's a battle of ideas. It's a battle about the best way to be effective and whether it's mitigation or trying to dismantle sort of the industrialized uh, economies that we have now. And we'll just kind of see which ideas went out in the end. It's uh, This is the battlefield of ideas that we deal with every day. So hopefully Metropole provides a very good perspective on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And it's like, you know, taking a data-driven approach and understanding that each individual wants to know about wh where their money is going. It, it's a really a way to democratize this question of, you know, and there's a question there about, you know, how many intellectual resources are going into the theories of international development and development provision and aid provision. But, you know, having people take a stand themselves is how a lot of this is supported. Um, but I, I, I think this is a question that I've always been interested in. It, it sort of, it's, it's about like, you know, do you put the onus on yourself or do you take that onus off by giving, you know, paying for it, right? It's the same thing with like carbon tax um, uh, trading schemes where, yeah, it's great that Boeing can tell you all of their flights are carbon neutral, but in reality, they're just, pay, you know, paying to give their um, emissions credits to someone else. Um, when it comes to this article and towards the end, you were discussing these personal choices, like the data impact of eating chicken, for example, uh, the data-driven impact of, you know, consuming meat, um, and that you refer, refer, refer to this as, a pers of, of, of an effectively altruistic personality trait. Can you explain that a little bit uh, further? Yeah, I think uh, for the individual action, um, and there's actually one thing that's interesting about effective altruism, is they say if you can be more effective with the time that you give to a charity with what you're able to donate, and perhaps you have a particular skill that makes it so that a, a charity can be very successful, then that is a form of effective altruism. In many cases, though, what is more effective is just providing funds and some of your income. And there are cases of hedge fund managers who believe a lot in a particular cause, and they will make $250,000 a year, and, but they will give away about 80% of their income. Mm. Uh, so that's a way that they're able to sort of work for the cause without necessarily actually being the one who is working in the nonprofit or running mm -hmm. it. So that's, that's very interesting. But it comes down to personal choice and what we're able to do. Mm -hmm. If you believe, um, if you look at the field of veganism, uh, sure. vegans are very loud and passionate people. Uh, there's, there's a lot of debate online and throughout society about the impact of animals and our impact on them. And I think uh, the vegan philosophical questions have been some of the most interesting. And I think it does come down to personal choice and really how you think you can make an impact. And what I think is also interesting to see is that you have all these companies that are rising up, things like Beyond Meat and Impossible sure. Burger. These are meat alternatives that are not using conventional farming nor animals to make products that taste or look like meat. And it's something that's being offered to people. Yeah. So this is kind of a way that you are having some sort of path towards having that more sustainable future that's not necessarily you having to go out and plant things yourself that actually are provided by the market. And mm -hmm. I think there's there are going to be a lot more innovations, and that will be a lot more interesting to come out. And, and hopefully people can read more about some of the other innovations in the next edition of the Metropole magazine. Cool. Well, let's hope that the uh, new magazine can accommodate that. You know, I, I think for myself, you know, it's, it's practical, right, to make decisions in this data-driven capacity that is through this effective altruistic lens. Uh, you know, but I have personal subjectivity and I, you know, I have feelings, right? I, I, I'm not driven always by data and, you know, I can't necessarily have that at my disposal when I make these decisions in all cases. Um, and, you know, I enjoy the fact that, you know, I exercise subjectivity in some of my choices and that, you know, how far can we take this idea of effective altruism? I, I, I recognize you mentioned this, you know, that people, you know, do process it for themselves. You know, I, I just wanted to sort of pose that as a last question. Yeah, I think it's, it is, we're going to have to focus a lot more on, and this is what the people that I spoke to talked about, is we'll have to think more about not just intent, but impact. Mm. Um, I think we can all intend to save the animals, save the environment, and there's a lot of us who are very passionate about those topics. But we have to look at what are the best charities or the best avenues or the best ways that I can provide resources to actually make a difference, to make a change. And I think that the field of economics uh, does rise up and is very simpatico with a lot of effective altruism. So there's a lot of economic analysis there. 
but at the same time it is ethics it's about the best ways that we can improve the lives of the people around us mm -hmm. so if we can take that into calculation if we can think about the best ways and what we're passionate about if we can bring them together that is what effective altruism is all about so it was interesting and fascinating to learn about it i think it's pretty cool uh, something that I think everybody will benefit by reading from, and even if you don't agree with it 100%, at least brings up some very interesting ideas that could make our world a better place. Cool, yeah, thanks so much. I mean, it sounds like a question of communications that Metropole's here to do to really, you know, throw out that idea of impact versus intent. So thanks again so much, Yale, for, for coming on the show tonight. We really appreciated it. Um, happy to have you on again, and thanks so much for contributing to to this edition, which... Uh, for everyone who's out there, you can find on our uh, Metropole shop uh, and learn all about effective altruism and all these other exciting themes. So appreciate it. Thank, thanks so much. Don't be a stranger. We, <laughs> I will be sure not to. Uh, <laughs> great. So we're, we're thanks again, everyone, for for tuning in today. Um, un, unconventional for us to have a salon in over the internet uh, from our respective households and well this is my room not quite a living room or, or a, a, a kitchen but um, I felt like it went well I learned something today um, and just wanted to say that at, at, at Metropo we're really working hard to deliver you guys this news both about the coronavirus and everything else that's uh, going on in our lives and also some interesting pieces that that maybe take us away from these themes and questions of of, uh, of coronavirus because as we learned yesterday from Holly who's a mental health and emotional health expert it's important to walk away from uh, some of the onslaught of, of, of breaking news updates um, which is great for the media cycle but uh, I think we need to, to yeah <laughs> respect our own mental health as much as possible um, so if you guys could yeah subscribe to Metropole if you're not subscribers already uh, it really makes a difference to to our product and what we're able to achieve uh, and continue to achieve. Um, on top of that, we've set up a couple of forums to support everyone during this challenging period. Um, on our website, you'll see the sort of flashing red Corona updates. This is the Corona updates in English page where um, you'll get as quickly as we can English language uh, translations of, of anything going on in Austria and relevant information from outside of Austria. Uh, and on top of that, we have a Vienna community board, a Vienna Cor community coronavirus board on Facebook, uh, where if you have questions that you want to ask people in your neighborhood, maybe you want to link up with someone else um, to help, you know, someone get groceries or uh, kind of things, this board is there for you guys. Um, tomorrow at the same time, 630, we will have Benj uh, coming on board, our COO who was on earlier to talk about a couple of interesting themes, which are to be determined. So... Uh, stay tuned tomorrow morning. We'll send out another scheduled uh, Facebook Live show, uh, Metropole Dispatch. Um, and again, tell us what you guys want to hear. Um, there's all sorts of exciting themes, coronavirus related or not, that we can get into on this forum if you guys are enjoying it. Uh, let us know either on the comment sections of this video or elsewhere, and uh, we'll do our best to accommodate that. Uh, don't be a stranger, and thanks again for tuning in. <laughs>